U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim Schultz. I'm the Associate Dean of Academics, and it is my privilege to spend a minute with you, just a minute, right up front before our, uh, our expert comes up and talks to us about robots that fly, swim, and crawl. Thank you for attending. For those out in Zoom world, thank you for tuning in. And for those historians in the far-flung future, centuries from now, who are in the archives, you're about to spend an hour looking at something, viewing something that's going to really inform your awareness of how drones were, were manifesting themselves in this early part of the century, and you're going to learn a lot from a true expert. And this true expert is sitting right down there. It's Professor John Jackson. He's been at the Naval War College for 25 years, all of 25 years in a row. Before then, or he retired as a Navy captain. His focus was supply and logistics, so he's one of those people who really knows how the Navy works. And he knows a lot of other things. He's uh, really become an expert in this field of drone technology. And he has one of the best official titles, maybe the best official title at the Naval War College. He is the Elmer A. Sperry Chair of Unmanned and Robotic Systems. I don't think that one's matched, John. That is an outstanding title. He's the author of a book titled One Nation Under Drones. He teaches our unmanned systems and conflict in the 21st century, not once a year, but twice a year. It's one of the very few electives offered more than once because it is so important and it's so popular and it's so well taught with his co-professor, uh, Mike Sherlock, uh, that it's something we absolutely cherish. Now, John, has many capabilities and he goes by many titles. I could go through a whole alphabet of titles. The Avatar of Autonomy, the Baron of Bots, the Caesar of Cyborgs. I can go all the way to the end of the alphabet, the, uh, the uh, XYZ axis of excellence, but I will stop at D, which is the Duke of Drones. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Professor John Jackson, the Duke of Drones. Well, good afternoon. And uh, I want to ask the people in the control room to stay focused out here because I'm going to tell the Admiral there were 500 people in the audience and 1,000 on Zoom. And there's nobody in the audience that's going to say that's not correct. Is that right, ma'am? OK, thank you. Hey, it's a great pleasure to be here. And what we're going to talk about is uh, robots and unmanned systems. Particularly pleased to have some uh, young folks with us today. And so uh, it's an important topic. It's a serious topic, but we try to have a little bit of fun with it. So uh, as we go through, if you feel like there's some humor, just go ahead and enjoy it. So. Uh, Basically, you can't pick up a magazine, a newspaper, or anything else and not find something related to drones. Uh, we are seeing them more and more in almost every aspect of our life. If you talk about artificial intelligence, it's even a larger field of study. But uh, we're going to focus primarily on kind of mechanical systems and robotics and how they work. So you uh, ask, you know, is this a new idea? And like almost everything, you find out not really. Uh, if you look back to 1918, this is the Sperry Automatic Airplane. Now, in 1918, you were lucky to get an airplane in the sky, period. Somebody said, well, could we do it without a pilot? So what they would do in this case is they would load that airplane up with a whole bunch of explosives. They'd point it in the general direction of the target. It would count how many times the propeller went around, and when it reached a certain number, the engine would cut off and it would dive on the target. 
not exactly precision guided munitions, uh, but it was uh, workable. And even though this was at the after the end of the war, it was never used in combat, but it was a design that uh, had a lot of promise. About the same time, radio control was coming in, and when they finally married up radio control and unmanned aircraft, they had a uh, much more capable system, and that's where they moved forward after the uh, First World War. Jumping to the Second World War, don't have time to cover every decade. This is a uh, Denny mite. Uh, your grandmother or great-grandmother may have known of a a Hollywood actor named Reginald Denny. And he was an actor, but he was also interested in radio-controlled airplanes. In uh, the artillery business and naval uh, gunfire, if you've got to practice. And so the way they would generally do that is take an airplane with a man in it, and they would fly with a uh, uh, air thing behind them. They'd call the uh, target, uh, and they would tell the uh, shooters, shoot behind the airplane at the target not at the airplane. Well, it didn't always work out that way. So uh, Reginald Denny said, well, you know, maybe we could use these uh, radio-controlled airplanes either to tow the target, tow the sleeve, or to be the target itself. And they ultimately built uh, 14,000 of these airplanes in the Second World War. They were built by a company, Radio Plane, and the Army Air Corps sent out a photographer to see who was building these drones. And he saw this attractive young woman who was building drones. And he said, you know, I think she could probably do more than just build drones. It's Marilyn Monroe. So if you have the ultimate bar bet, you know, how did Marilyn Monroe get her start? It was building drones in the Second World War. Now, I've heard a nasty rumor that Lady Gaga is getting into the drone business, and if that's true, I'm getting out of the drone business, just to, uh, just to be sure. So what I'm gonna talk about tonight is uh, aerial systems, maritime systems, ground systems, and some issues that cross all of those domains. With the aerial systems, we'll start with the biggest and then work our way down into smaller ones. This is the Global Hawk. This is an Air Force uh, unmanned aircraft. It's strictly a surveillance platform, uh, does not carry weapons, but it can basically fly from California to Maine, spend eight to 10 hours overlooking what goes on in Maine, and then fly back to California. Or if you're talking about a real world situation, you're gonna be flying in some theater of conflict, reporting back on what's going on on the ground or in the water. Uh, it's usually operated out of Sacramento, California by a, a team of Air Force officers and it's been very successful in doing uh, surveillance uh, and uh, uh, overview of what's going on. Well, the Navy says, you know, we've got a lot of area we'd like to cover as well. And so this is the Triton. This is the Navy version of Global Hawk, if you will. Again, strictly a surveillance platform. You see the carrier down there, it does not take off from a carrier, it does not land on a carrier, it's far too big to do that. But it's part of the Maritime Patrol Aviation Community, uh, which Admiral Garvin, uh, our president, served in for many years. Uh, this aircraft is unmanned, it's designed to cooperate with the P-8 manned aviation aircraft. And this is a picture of one of the uh, aircraft, one of the Triton, and that's me out at uh, Point Magoo. And you can tell how big the airplane is because I'm six foot three. And you're not buying that? Here, I'll show. See, that's me and one of my colleagues. And if you look, I'm clearly six foot six. So, uh, so when I tell you that's how big it is, that's how big it is. So. A little bit smaller, but uh, incredibly uh, successful is the Reaper, the MQ-9 Reaper. Uh, the Air Force started off with uh, Predator, and now it's an all Reaper force. And this is a surveillance platform, but it also carries missiles and carries bombs. So not only can it locate a target, if the decision is made we need to attack the target, they're able to do that. 
Apparently back in, uh, in uh, days past, uh, they were flying a surveillance aircraft and they spotted a very tall individual with a white uh, turban in Afghanistan and they said, you know, that, I think maybe that's bin Laden. By the time they were able to get a weapons carrying aircraft there, he was gone. And so that's when it was actually the CIA said, do you think you could launch a weapon off that at, uh, aircraft without ripping the wings off of it? And that's what they did. Uh, ultimately, uh, as I say, incredibly successful. Uh, the Air Force has uh, enough to fly 65 combat air patrols seven, hour, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and that's still not enough to meet all of the requirements. The uh, headquarters for the, uh, the Reaper world is in Creech Air Force Base outside Las Vegas. Uh, this is me. And the Air Force has a hole that they make the Navy guys stand in so the Air Force guys look taller. But uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So, so again, the Air Force uh, is flying from shore and Navy is flying the Triton from shore. But Navy said, you know, it'd be nice if we had an aircraft that could operate off an aircraft carrier flight deck. And so they developed the UKSD. This is the Unmanned Combat Air Systems Demonstrator. And this, again, is an idea of how big the aircraft is uh, in comparison to that very, very tall person. Uh, the design was to experiment and see if this aircraft could operate off a flight deck, could it operate in the same airspace as manned aircraft, what missions could it do. Primarily, it was designed for surveillance. But they said, wait a minute, uh, how do we keep these things in the air? Well, they could do air-to-air -air refueling. And if we have any pilots in the, uh, in the audience and whatnot, you know, air-to-air -air refueling is one of the more demanding tasks that any pilot is asked to do. But they were able to, uh, to do that successfully. So then I decided, okay, that was the experimental process. It was never intended to be an operational aircraft. The next generation, what is it going to do? Some people thought it should be a penetrating attack aircraft that would go across the beach and attack uh, targets. Some thought it should just be a surveillance platform. Interestingly enough, the Navy said, you know what it needs to be? It needs to be an air-to-air -air refueler because it's a requirement that the uh, Navy has and it, currently it's being supported by F and A-18 fighter aircraft which carry an extra refueling pod. Well, they can do the job. They don't have the range or the endurance. And also, we're burning up a lot of high-value fighter aircraft and attack aircraft that should be doing a more important mission. So they awarded a contract to Boeing to develop the MQ-25 Alpha Stingray as an air-to-air -air refueler. I kind of like Stingray because I drive a Corvette, so that's kind of my baby there. This is a uh, actual photo of the uh, Stingray uh, doing an air-to-air -air refueling for a fighter aircraft. So they have already <clears throat> reconfigured a number of aircraft carriers with an unmanned aircraft control center, and we hope to have these aircraft flying operationally off carriers within the next 18 months. Uh, we have several demonstrators that Boeing has built and they're being used to, uh, to make sure that everything is designed properly, works properly and whatnot. So we believe that this aircraft will uh, come online in the, in the near term and provide a great capability. So your, your F-18s, your F-22s, your F-35s, whatever the case may be, can take off and fly a certain distance, refuel, have the range to go in and attach their targets, come back out, potentially refuel again so they can get back to either their base or to the aircraft carrier. So it's gonna provide a, a tremendous cap capability for the Navy. The uh, Air Force and again CIA has been operating also the RQ-170 Sentinel. Uh, this was once called the Beast of Kandahar because it was flying out of Kandahar, Afghanistan. They would see it on the runway, really not know what it was. It is a flying wing design, low observable surveillance craft. And I'm sure you are all familiar with this photo. This is the night of the Bin Laden raid when they took Bin Laden down. 
And you can see uh, President Obama, Vice President Biden, the Secretary of State, and other folks are sitting there watching the screen. And what they are watching is video feed coming back from the RQ-170, showing them what's going on in that evolution. So that is a capability that uh, is, is needed. The stealth gives you uh, benefits that you don't get uh, with other aircraft. And <clears throat> is there an RQ-180 out there flying somewhere? I don't know. I try to stay out of the uh, classified world, but uh, if I was a betting man, I think perhaps maybe there may be. So those are pretty good sized airplanes. Those are like uh, fighter sized aircraft uh, or larger. We're gonna shrink down a little bit, and this is the Blackjack. This is a Marine Corps uh, asset. And basically, particularly if you're in a ground situation, you always wanna know what's on the other side of the hill before you have to go over there and fight. So, if you have Predators airborne, you have uh, Global Hawks up there, you know, you can request, would you fly over and tell me what's going on in this position? Well, they may have assets available, they may not. They may have them doing something more important. So the Marines, the Special Forces, and other folks have said, you know, we need drones that we can take with us, that we can control, and will give us that situational awareness that we need. And this is, a, again, an indicator of the size of the, uh, the blackjack. Now, I'll warn you, I, I did this slideshow and my boss said, I sent you to Las Vegas for a five-day conference. Obviously, you went around one day, took all the pictures. You're wearing the same shirt in every picture. So the moral is change your shirts before you go and take your pictures, particularly if you're going to sneak out and play golf or something. So let's shrink down even smaller. This is the Aero Vironment switchblade. And you can see how small that is. The uh, operator is looking in a device where he can see what the, uh, the drone is seeing. It launches from a con compressed gas cylinder. And it'll fly for about uh, 45 minutes. And the thing about this drone is it has a warhead. And when it launches, it is going to blow up one way or the other. You don't want this one coming back. So the design is such that you follow the target if you want to attack a truck, a number of people, a, a, a tank, whatever the case may be. If you do not have a target, you will go ahead and just crash it and, uh, and destroy the aircraft. But it's kind of a backpackable cruise missile, and the folks in the, uh, the ground war business really, really uh, like this and uh, have had a lot of success with it. This is called Blackwing, and this is a switchblade that has been converted for surveillance work. No, no warhead in this version, but it launches from a submarine. So submarines like to stay underwater and uh, try and stay as uh, uh, silent as they can. So they can launch this aircraft from a, a, a tube under the water. It'll fly up and report back. You have to keep your antenna up at least to get your information back. But in effect, it gives you a 1,000 foot tall periscope. And it gives the submariner the opportunity to see what's going on around him visually. And then when it's finished with its mission, it just crashes at sea. The uh, cost of these things is such that they're, they're attritable. You do not need to attempt to recover them. Well, they have capability, so this is the Switchblade 600, which is a larger version, and it's currently being used in Ukraine and in other locations. Again, it fires out of that compressed gas uh, cylinder and goes off and does its mission, and the 600 can loiter for more like an hour, hour and a half. So it can be above the target, sending back information of what's going on, and then this one does have a warhead so it can attack the target. There's a lot of discussion of what's going on in Ukraine, what's going on with uh, unmanned aerial vehicles in particular. Uh, we had a briefing last night from an expert who told us that there are currently so many air, uh, rotary wing aircraft drones in the air that anything that moves on the ground will be seen and will be attacked within about 90 seconds. 
And that applies to Russians who are going to be seen and attacked and Ukrainians who are going to be seen and attacked. So it's just absolutely almost created a stalemate in terms of the ground war because there are so many of these systems involved. And they tend to pa uh, park the Russian uh, tanks at night. So the Ukrainians send up a surveillance uh, drone with infrared capability, identify where the target is, and then send in something like a uh, switchblade to attack the target. So, you know, a, uh, a, a piece of equipment that cost in the uh, tens of thousands of dollars of destroying tanks and armored vehicles that cost uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. So very, very successful. This is an interesting picture that was shown last night, and this is a group of helicopters of drones, and they're sitting on top of their uh, plastic display cases, so it's a little hard to see how they, uh, they are there. But uh, Ukraine has said they're gonna build a million drones this next year. They're building over 100,000 per month in little workshops all over Ukraine. They're importing the circuit boards and the motors and everything that they need to put them together. They put them together, they test them, they fly them, and then they turn them over to the military folks who put a weapon, a grenade, a bomb under it, and then use them to execute the targets. So uh, you watch more, you'll see more about how these things are being used uh, in Ukraine and in other locations. So let's talk about uh, another form of fixed wing aircraft, and this is the Loyal Wingman. And the notion here is, you know, could we build an unmanned aircraft that has the speed and endurance to fly with a fighter aircraft and carry additional weapons, do surveillance, do jamming? So you could have an F-35 that's flying with six loyal wingmen flying alongside and you send the loyal wingman unmanned aircraft in to jam the uh, uh, the radars in your target area you send them in to launch weapons and it significantly extends the capability of the fighter aircraft the attack aircraft using the loyal wingman a number of these are being built a number of different companies and number of countries involved and so you'll see more and more of this so the aviators go, am I going to be replaced? And the answer is no, you're not really going to be replaced. There's going to be manned, unmanned teaming. It's going to be a combination. And that the robot is going to do some of the jobs and the human beings are going to do other parts of the job. This is an interesting project that DARPA is looking into called Long Shot. And in this case, that's a fairly large drone that would be carried under the belly of that fighter or attack aircraft and then it would break off and fly in closer to the target area, and then a number of weapons would come out of that carrying aircraft and attack the targets. So again, it's a way to get more weapons on target with uh, aviation assets. And this is one of the more interesting ones. It's called Gremlins. And the idea here is that what if you had a C-130 aircraft or a C-5 aircraft that could carry a number of drones in the back of the airplane? You basically kick them out. They go and do whatever uh, mission they're supposed to do, jamming, electronic warfare, surveillance. They come back, they match up with the C-130, who then winches it back into the airplane. They take it back, fuel it up, and bring it out and use it again. So they have actually done this as an exercise to be able to have that drone aircraft come up behind the C-130, connect with a drogue. It looks kind of like a refueling uh, drogue. And shut off its engine, and it gets winched back up into the airplane. So that's Gremlins, and we'll see more about that. One of the big questions that we worry about a lot is uh, swarms. Uh, you know, the idea is we could probably stop one or two drones or we could stop a handful of drones, uh, use Vulcan Phalanx gun and other systems uh, on board ship. The question is, what if it's 100 or 500 or 1,000 drones that are coming in? How do you deal with swarms? And that's one of the great concerns that we've got. And a lot of issues, can we use lasers to knock them down? Can we use jamming? Can we use different ways to physically stop these swarms coming in? And so there's a lot of work being done in that area as well. Now let's talk about rotary wing. Uh, 
This guy apparently doesn't like his legs because I would never get on something with all those spinning propellers and go fly somewhere, but that was a design that somebody came up with an elect electrified uh, mini helicopter, if you will. A little more practical, this is the MQ-8C Fire Scout, and it is a drone helicopter. They took a Bell 407 helicopter, which are used all over the world, and they basically put an unmanned operator in it, painted the windows gray, and it flies both from ships and from shore. This is, again, an indicator of the size of the uh, Fire Scout, and it's been used very successfully again. And the issue there is you're not going to lose a pilot. You're not going to have, if it goes down in hostile territory, you don't have a potential hostage situation or lose a pilot. And so the idea of being able to have an unmanned aircraft is, is very attractive. The Navy is flying a number of uh, these off of uh, uh, destroyers, cruisers, and they basically will carry a manned helicopter and an unmanned helicopter. And for some missions, the manned helicopter flies. In other cases, it's the unmanned helicopter, depending on what the requirement is. This is the Lockheed Martin K-Max, and this was originally built as an aerial logger. It would fly into an area, they would cut the log out, they'd pick it up, carry it in, that way they didn't have to have haul roads and all the destruction that is involved in a logging operation. Well, after 9-11, the, uh, the company said, you know, I think this can do more than whole logs. Uh, and so they developed a version of the unmanned helicopter. The airplane weighs 6,000 pounds and it can carry 6,000 pounds. And it has flown extensively in uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and now it's uh, being looked at by the Air Force, the Army, and said, you know, do we want to, in fact, spend the money to have an unmanned helicopter asset available to us to do what we need to do? Navy's always interested in uh, aviation at sea. If you have an aircraft carrier, you can do it. Uh, what if you don't have an aircraft carrier? A lot of different programs are in the works. This one is called VBAT, and it's a ducted fan, and it's got uh, the wings, as you can see, and it will take off straight up, lean over, fly in, do its mission six, up to 600 miles away, come back, lean back up on its nose, and settle right back down on the uh, the flight deck of the uh, small ship and whatnot. Uh, very, very capable. You can take this thing and launch it in a matter of minutes and you can recover it with just like one individual on the flight deck as you can see there. So that's VBAT and we'll see more of that coming. Getting even smaller, this is uh, the Instant Eye Quad Rotor. So quad rotor, four rotors. Uh, again, the Marines said, you know, we want to know what we're going to run into. So they have a program they call Quads for Squads, and every Marine squad has their backpacked drone, which can be launched and go and see what's going on and send that image back so you're prepared for whatever you have to do. And then the smallest version, this is the Black Hornet Nano Drone. Looks like a toy, but it isn't. A uh, soldier uh, will carry two of them in a small pack on their chest. They take them out, they throw them in the air, they're battery powered, they fly for about 20 minutes, send back real-time imagery of what it sees, then they bring it back and they take it, put it back in their pack, which recharges it, and they can go off and fly again. The uh, Special Forces folks, the SEALs, uh, the Brits, and others are very, very interested in this and have used these fairly extensively. Uh, so again, they look like a toy, but they're not, and they uh, uh, give, again, a capacity, a capability that is, is unique and something that they uh, really like to have. This is a, uh, another rotorcraft idea. We've talked mostly about military systems. This is a, a Chinese company called Ehang, and this is their UAV taxi. And the notion here is you go up to it, you open the cockpit uh, cabin door, you get in there, there's an iPad, you push fly me to Tiverton, you push the button, it takes off. No pilot, 
No parachute, just one terrified passenger. <laughs> But they're doing a lot of work on this. It's being tested in a lot of places. And both Uber and Lyft are saying, you know, the future is not in, in cars that you can call and take you someplace. It's in helicopters that you could go to the top of some building in a city and get in your aerial taxi and take off, and it'll take you where you need to go. This is another version called the Volocopter. And that's me uh, in Singapore in the uh, pilot seat. Uh, it can be manned or it can be unmanned. And as you can see, it's circular, and those are electric propellers all the way around. And it gives you ability to, uh, again, do that aerial taxi mode that you'd, uh, you'd like to do. So the uh, sky's going to get crowded. Uh, I know a lot of the aviators are not too thrilled with having uh, these unmanned things flying around, but, but they are, in fact, coming. Probably a lot of you have toy drones. Uh, there's hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, this is a picture of one that uh, crashed on the White House lawn in January of 2015. You may have heard about it. There was actually an American government employee, New Year's, said, I wonder if I can fly my drone over to the White House. And he did, and it crashed. And it's very difficult to defend against because it's small, you can't really see it, it's not made of metal, so it's hard to detect. Uh, you've probably all seen pictures now of the White House with people on the roof with shoulder-fired weapons and whatnot to attempt to, uh, to knock these things down. And there's been a lot of different ways that you can knock these down. So uh, get ready for the best picture of the day. All right, are you ready, Cheryl? This is my John Wayne picture. Ta -da. So this is me out on the grass in front of the Naval War College with a, a weapon called Skywall. And what this is, is it's a gun. It has a viewfinder. You look through the viewfinder, and as the quad rotor comes by, you follow it, and the viewfinder uh, will go beep, 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 press the button. You press the button. A compressed gas canister sends out a projectile which goes to where the target is, splits open, puts out a net and a parachute, catches the drone and brings it down. That way you don't hit anybody in the head, which is good. Uh, you can find the drone and maybe figure out where it came from. And it is a uh, very, very successful Skywall. I've seen pictures of it accompanying Air Force One in various locations. And they even have a permanent installation of Skywall that you could put on the top of Loose Hall if you thought somebody was coming for us and whatnot. So uh, I actually used that as my Christmas card picture one year. So <laughs> my poor wife, what can I say? Now there's other ways to knock down drones. This is a... Uh, uh, called Drone Killer, and this is an uh, electronic jammer, and this is designed to basically focus on the drone and either jam it so it loses the signal and it goes crazy and lands somewhere else, or you even have versions that are strong enough, powerful enough to burn out the electronics in the, uh, in the drone that you're looking at. Problem with that is uh, you're also jamming your own radars and your communications. And if you were going to use something like drone killer outside an airport or something, a civilian airport, you're going to screw up a lot of stuff. So the idea of using a kinetic thing like uh, Skywall is very good. They've even gone as far as to train hawks to attack drones. And they've actually done it successfully. The ASPCA says, well, wait a minute now, the hawks are going to hurt their little claws when they go grab that thing. So they built little bitty Kevlar gloves and put them on the hawks. And uh, the hawks have uh, intercepted a number of drones. So not really practical, but again, when you're, when you're trying to find a way to stop these things, you'll do whatever you can. So, so that's kind of the aviation piece. Let's move ahead to uh, unmanned surface vehicles. Uh, a lot of talk about the Navy having a number of large, small, medium, and large unmanned surface vessels. 
and uh, there is a lot of design work being done. There is a number of them that are actually currently afloat. This is the uh, Sea Hunter, which is, uh, was originally called the Autonomous Continuous Trail Unmanned Vehicle, ACTIVE. We love acronyms. And the notion there is that this thing was originally going to follow submarines, enemy submarines, and stay with them and until they forced them to surface or until you decided you were going to have to attack them and you uh, would uh, have a weapon. This is a Chinese version of, uh, of a similar approach to an unmanned surface vessel. Looks very similar and you know there's a lot of espionage that goes on. This is the Ghost Fleet Overlord, so the uh, Navy and DARPA have purchased vehicles, converted them to unmanned use. They have sailed from Norfolk, Virginia through the Panama Canal to San Diego. They have gone from San Diego to Hawaii out in the Western, into the Western Pacific. And basically getting them to operate, understand the rules of the road, uh, coal regs, collision regulations and whatnot, is doable. Uh, they will sometimes put a safety party on board, at least these days while they're still doing experimental work. And the question is, what are you going to do with these things? And some of them, they call them an arsenal ship. So it's an unmanned ship that carries maybe 400 additional missiles. If you've got a cruiser that's going to have 36 to 60 uh, uh, m missiles on board, what do you do when those are all fired? Well, what if you had an arsenal ship traveling with you that you could then target and just launch the additional weapons from those ships? So exactly how Navy is going to use these small, medium, and large unmanned surface vessels is being determined. There is an experimental group in San Diego that's operating a number of these vessels and trying to develop the techniques and strategy they're going to use to use them. In the civilian side, this is an artist's concept of a unmanned commercial ship. Commercial ships as it is have a very small crew and you know, dozen perhaps. And uh, I, you know those of you who are surface warfare folks and whatnot have seen some of them out there moving around. You wonder if there's anybody aboard. Well, fact of the matter is there's no requirement to have a human being. And theoretically, you could have a command situation in London or someplace that is going to operate these ships, take them into port, unload them, and then take them back out and send them wherever you need to do. So again, technology is going to allow us to do things that's going to save money in terms of uh, manpower, but also get the job done. This is an interesting concept called sail drone. And the notion here is if you want to have a surveillance platform on the surface of the ship, of the sea, this is me here in uh, Newport getting ready to launch a sail drone. The sail drone will go out and it is operated purely by the wind. And that sail is moved from a remote operator, in, usually in San Francisco, and it will go and move as necessary and the rudder will move and it will go out and spend weeks or months at a time doing ocean surveillance, measuring uh, temperature, salinity of the water, et cetera. And it's very, very interesting to the Navy because it gives you the ability to have eyeballs where you not, wouldn't not necessarily have those eyeballs before. So. On this occasion, the University of Rhode Island was operating these sail drones and they were sending it out into the Atlantic current to see how that operates. And they have sent sail drones into hurricanes. They're very, very robust. They have solar panels on them, but that's primarily to uh, power the electronic communication systems and whatnot. So uh, keep an eye out. Uh, they're, they're all painted orange with big signs that say, leave us alone. Uh, they did have an opportunity where the uh, Iranians captured a sail drone and brought it on board their ship. And the Navy had to uh, make a lot of noise and say, give us, give us our drone back, which they, they ultimately did. So that's surface. We'll talk a little bit, uh, very briefly, about submarine uh, subsurface. A lot of different designs. 
the largest, these are small ones, these are man portable, and uh, hundreds of these are operated. Uh, some of them you need uh, you know, a crane to put them over the side, the small one in the corner down there, are man portable, and you put them in the water, and they sail off, and again, they do whatever kind of survey you want them to do, and then come back and you recharge them and you use them again. So those are good, and the uh, Navy oceanography people use them, and other folks use them. But U.S. Navy has said, what, what, el what else could we get? This is the uh, Echo Voyager, the ORCA program. <clears throat> this is an unmanned submarine. It's 80 feet in length, it's eight feet in diameter, and it dives to 11,000 feet depth of water. Now, 1,100 feet depth is incredible. 11,000 is almost unheard of. But it will carry mines. It will carry uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, will carry missiles, uh, can potentially could carry seals, not from 11,000 feet, but from shallow water. And basically, uh, Boeing's position is that it's a truck. And you tell us what you want it to do, and we will design the system to do it. This is me at the launching of the Echo Voyager out in Huntington Beach, and I wasn't wearing a blue shirt, but I can add it, so there's my, there's my blue shirt. So I have finally beat that joke to death, so I will not use that joke anymore. This is uh, the Orca, the Echo Voyager, uh, on the ground, and so you can see the size of the payload section. That's a 34-foot payload section, and you can just imagine what kind of things could you do if you had that kind of capability. The Orca program has five submarines currently under construction, and there's a lot of interest from allies around the world, uh, JMSDF in particular. And the oil and gas industry is very interested in these because you can do uh, uh, pipeline surveillance, pipeline construction, uh, undersea cable uh, surveillance, et cetera. So I think you're gonna see a lot more of these built. They're about $100 million. It's a lot of money in my checking account, but compared to a multi-billion dollar manned submarine, it's an incredibly uh, efficient way to do business. It's a diesel electric submarine, so it goes out and operates for about 48 hours on its batteries. Then it comes up to the surface, puts up a snorkel, runs a diesel generator, recharges the battery, goes back out and does what it's gonna do. And it's designed to operate for up to six months at a time. So it can go out off the uh, port somewhere and can sit down at the bottom, come up periodically, see what's going on, report back, uh, uh, what it's seen and then go back down and continue to do that. So it's only about eight or nine knots speed of advance, but it, uh, it over 24 hour period, over a six month period, it can cover a lot of territory. It can be airlifted in a C-5 or a C-17 aircraft. So you put the three parts, comes in three pieces, you put them in an airplane, fly them to where you want them, put them together, take a 50-ton yacht, 50 ton yacht crane and put them in the water and it swims off and does its thing. Or you can conceivably uh, carry them on a bigger submarine or you could put them in the well deck of an uh, amphibious ship. So there's a lot of different ways of being looked, looked at to use the, uh, the ORCA program. So keep an eye out for that, more, more to come. We'll talk ground vehicles very briefly. And, uh, PacBot is probably the most famous, and it's an uh, unexploded ordnance disposal robot, and it's designed to go out and uh, go near a uh, target and find out is it just a piece of trash or is it a bomb that's been placed there and whatnot. If they determine it's a bomb, it can leave a destructive charge, back off, and wire design or detonate the explosive. So a lot of lives have been saved by pack bots and uh, similar vehicles in the explosive ordnance disposal world. This is one called Kinetic, and this in effect is a miniature tank. It has a machine gun, it has a tear gas dispenser, it has a laser dazzler, it has a microphone, and basically you roll it into an area and the microphone says clear the area or we're going to engage. And if necessary, the operator can then use the weapons. 
that's a picture of one of the former presidents here. Uh, uh, when I told the base I was bringing a robot with a machine gun on board, uh, you know how hard it is to get on base sometimes. It was a little tricky to get the robot on board, but uh, we managed to do it. This is <clears throat> the MUT, and this is a tactical transport vehicle. What people don't realize is that if you're a uh, ground pounder, if you're a, uh, somebody doing uh, fighting on the ground, the amount of weight you carry on your back is actually more than a knight in shining armor carried in the days of old. So you're told you're gonna get on an airplane, you're gonna fly somewhere, we're gonna kick out the door, throw you out, you're gonna put all that stuff on your back, you're gonna go somewhere and you're gonna fight. So the thought is, is there a better way to do that? Could we get a robot system that would carry materials, would carry weapons, and would uh, go with the troops as they go and do their fighting? And so this trooper looks like he's holding the gun on the robot, so I'm not sure if he's uh, real firm about it. A lot of different designs. Are they gonna be wheeled? Are they gonna be tracked? Are they gonna be small versions, like the small one in the front there is, is a throw bot and you actually throw it through the window of a, uh, of a second floor building perhaps and it goes in there and it sends back pictures of what it sees and it sends back rec uh, audio of what it hears. And they find that when you chuck that thing in the window, a lot of people think it's gonna explode so they all scramble and whatnot. But it's really a surveillance platform and it's been designed so you can throw it off a five story building and it won't break. So the special forces people said, can you make it blow up? And I said, well, yeah, but which way do you want to go? <laughs> do, you, do you want to be able to throw it out and it won't blow up, or do you want it to blow up? So there's lots of things that blow up, so we're not going to change that one. This is Boston Dynamics. We just uh, recently took our class up there, and they do a whole series on the far side are some of these uh, transport vehicles, the, uh, the big dog, the uh, legged system that's designed to carry uh, uh, material and packs and whatnot. The problem is they're very noisy. Uh, these are diesel powered and whatnot and they make a lot of racket. And so the troops don't like making all that noise. But this is, uh, this is us up in uh, General Dynamics and that's Spot the Robot Dog. You may have seen him. You see him on TV dancing a lot and you see uh, his, his partners, Atlas, doing a lot of things and whatnot. But there's been over 1,800 spots built and they're used for surveillance, they're used for security, they go around a factory and they read various temperatures and they can turn valves and they can do these things. And they do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and do it in the dark, they don't need to, anything, they don't have a union, they don't get hurt, and so a lot of people are saying, you know, this is a potential way to do the security mission in a more efficient manner. I mentioned Atlas, this is uh, Atlas, this is the uh, uh, version that they've built with hydraulics, and they've just recently retired Atlas, and they've got a new electric version of Atlas, and so watch the news and you'll see him coming out. The Navy's interested in a firefighting robot. You know, when you go on a uh, compartment and you have to de-smoke uh, it, de-water it and whatnot, you need to bring the hose in and put out the fire. It would be nice if you had a, a uh, robot that could uh, load that in and do that work for you. So uh, a lot of work being done. I like to say, you know, we think we've seen robots walk forever. Well, that's on the movies and that's special effects. Making a robot walk is a very difficult thing. Boston Dynamics has really been one of the leading edge uh, companies in doing this, and they are able to get that, uh, that robot to walk very effect effectively. Uh, this is uh, one of my classes, and this is us out kind of playing our own version of BattleBots, and uh, there's lots of different versions of these things out there, and a lot of people are investing money in what they can do. Driverless cars, a lot of talk about driverless cars, you know. That yellow car where the guy's getting in the back seat and say, take me where you want to go. That's not the way they work. Uh, I don't know if there's any Tesla owners here in the room and whatnot, but Tesla has what they call full automatic driving. It really isn't. Uh, they require you to be behind the steering wheel and keep your hands on the steering wheel. 
touch it every 20 or 30 seconds to make sure you're still there. And there have been a number of people killed in Teslas because they were not doing that. Uh, one person that was killed uh, when they, they found that he was watching a video while he was driving down the road and uh, the, the Tesla was driving. So driverless cars are not there yet. They're getting there. They will get to the point where you can say, take me to Tiverton and it will do it. But, you know, Tesla and the other manufacturers of uh, driverless cars will tell you, you know, most of the accidents that happen are because of uh, driver error. And if you can eliminate some of that driver error, even if there are occasional robot errors, you're still going to save hundreds of thousands of lives. So. This is uh, another way that uh, drones are used for, uh, for good, if you will. This is a zip line drone. And this is operating in Africa. Uh, the, uh, a lot of the roads, the infrastructure, not so great, particularly in rainy seasons. So there's a company that operates a zip line, and they will take medicine, blood, uh, whatever you might need, uh, serum, and put it in a box and fly it. 120 miles to where you want it to go. The bomb bay opens up, it drops it out with a parachute, and then the plane comes back and does another mission. So it's a way to do what you need to do when the infrastructure doesn't st support you. This is an interesting, this is a, a, a defibrillator that has been used that uh, you fly it in. If somebody's having a heart attack, you fly it into where you need it. Uh, they've been using them also drones to uh, carry flotation devices at the beach to someone that's drowning, drop it, and then they uh, can go out and recover the people. So a lot of uses and precision guided uh, our agriculture is one that's uh, being used a lot, particularly in Japan, but in the United States increasingly. And here's the deal where you flow your, fly your drone over your crops, it tells you where the bugs are, where the infections are, where, the, where it needs more water, and then you can apply the, uh, the insecticide and whatnot with a drone, or you can water where you need. So uh, there's a potential for greatly increasing the, uh, the yield of uh, cropland by using unmanned systems. And this is uh, uh, a, a design that Google Air is talking about, and this is a... Uh, a uh, drone that will bring you whatever you order within 30 minutes. Now, I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't need anything within 30 minutes, <laughs> I don't think. But this will come over your house, and it'll drop it down on a line and disconnect and leave the item for you. Uh, they've used it a lot of places to deliver books, medicine, burritos, you name it. There's lots of pizzas. There's lots of ways you can do these things. But there's a lot of issues with it. And the FAA is very concerned about, you know, are we going to have hundreds or thousands of these things flying around in the low areas of, uh, of the airspace? And uh, do we really want to have that happening? So there's a lot of R&D being done and a lot of policy work being done. And this is a really crazy uh, uh, design that Amazon put out that said, what if we could have a flying warehouse and you're down at a football game, you decide you want a T-shirt, so you get on your phone, you tell them, bring me a T-shirt, and it brings you a T-shirt. Couldn't you just walk down to the concession stand and get it? I don't know, but, you know, crazy designs. So we've seen how uh, robots can fly, swim, and crawl. Uh, this is my book, One Nation Under Drones. Those are actually my pasty white feet. Uh, and uh, on the uh, swimming pool at the top of the uh, Marina Bay Sands Hotel in Singapore, I was there on business, believe me. And this was years ago before the current president came. So anyway, so that uh, concludes the presentation. And I am ready for anyone who might have questions. And if you, uh, if you have a question, please use the microphone at your chairs. Sir. Yes, uh, Professor, thank you. Um, earlier in your talk, you discussed the wide range, intercontinental range across oceans, controlled from a certain part of the country and then come back. What is the fuel source or energy that allows that, uh, that kind of... Uh, extended uh, use. 
Yeah, it depends. Now, the, you know, the ones that we're talking about, the longest range, nobody's really doing transatlantic kind of stuff with it. So you're, the, the Global Hawk is the most significant, and, and it is a jet engine, and so it carries enough fuel to, to do that mission. Uh, some of the smaller ones are battery powered. There's talk about potentially fuel cell for maximum kind of uh, uh, power density and whatnot. So it really depends on what the application is. And when we talk about them being commanded from Creech Air Force Base, that's a uh, satellite and undersea cable communications link. The aircraft stays in theater. So it stays in theater. It takes off. There's a launch and recovery element that puts the airplane in the air. Once it's airborne, it passes it off to the control group, wherever they might be, and they actually do the mission. And then when the airplane comes back, the, the uh, reco recovery element recovers the airplane. Because even using, and mostly it's undersea cable and then it's, it's satellite communications, you're still talking about a couple of seconds of delay for that communications signal to get through. And if you're flying in the air and you say turn right and it doesn't turn for a couple of seconds, not a big deal. If you're landing and you say pull up and it doesn't do it for a couple of seconds, you could have a disaster. So we still operate in an environment where there is a, uh, a eyeball watching what's going on and doing that uh, recovery mission and whatnot. So, other questions? We've got uh, one here that talks about uh, what do you do protect, to protect the uh, sophisticated electronics if it's shot down or captured. You know, there's a lot of different things you can do. You can encrypt your, uh, your system to begin with so that the data cannot be stolen. You can have explosive capabilities in the vehicle so that if someone attacks it or captures it, it can be, uh, be detonated. Every time you do that, it increases the cost and the sophistication and the, the complexity of the system. So in most cases, we've operated in an environment where we don't have enemy taking these things away from us and whatnot. What does the future hand, handle, uh, look for us in the future? Uh, it's gonna be a different world. You know, if you're talking about a high tech opponent, be it Chinese, Russian, whatever the case may be, Korean, you know, you're gonna have to be thinking about how do you protect these things both physically and electronically, and so it'll change the nature of the business. Questionnaire, who's winning the drone countermeasure world? U.S., I think, is kind of ahead at this point. Uh, we've been in the business a little longer than most of them, but uh, we have a real sensitivity to how these things are going to be used. We talked about the Echo Voyager and the ORCA program, and it can go out for, you know, uh, 48 hours and then recharge its batteries and go again. Well, the Russians and the Chinese are looking at putting a nuclear reactor on a similar-sized submarine and it could go indefinitely. But the U.S. is not gonna let a nuke wander around by itself out there in the ocean. So, you know, we, we are kind of the guys with the white hats and we uh, have a different set of rules. The notion of uh, who's gonna push the button to shoot is, you know, kept to a U.S., a, is kept to a, an individual, a human being, is gonna make that shoot, no shoot decision. Uh, others are not necessarily going to do the same thing. So it's a uh, kind of battle and back and forth between what we can do, what they can do, and we try to maintain you know, the best, uh, uh, best approach, the safest approach, and, uh, and do what needs to be done, but uh, do, it, do it appropriately. Talk about drones as a mobile command and control network. Uh, Communication relay is one of the real factors that they're used for. Uh, you know, a lot of times your communication is line of sight. So if you have a uh, antenna on a mountainside, you can do line of sight, talk to a lot of people. If you don't, then you're severely limited due to the curvature of the earth as to how far that signal is going to go. So if you can put something like a Scan Eagle or other aircraft in the air, can stay airborne for 24 hours at a time, you can transmit your signal to that platform and it transmits it on down to another platform. And they've even done series where it's gone from this operator <laughs> 
to this relay, to another relay, and ultimately down to the uh, operation unit that's trying to use it. So a lot of capability and, uh, and people are in enjoying the flexibility that it gives them. Any other uh, comments or questions? Sir. Just had a uh, question regarding the kinetic capture devices that you mentioned earlier. Um, so aircraft carriers have their hangar bays open traditionally when they're in uh, foreign ports. So have some of those kinetic capture devices been, uh, or is there a plan to lay them out to the fleet for ships force to use for defense? Yeah, there's there's a lot of concern, and there's you know there's a anti-drone system called Mattis that has been deck loaded onto amphibs as they've gone through the Suez Canal, for instance, and given you the ability to shoot down drones. In port, yeah, you know, it's a big open hole in the side of the ship, and uh, uh, there is discussion of using these. You know, you if a shotgun will probably take one of these things down. So it just depends on where are you shooting and what else is in the line of fire and whatnot. But uh, Skywall is, is one of the uh, bigger players in the business because it gives you that ability to be purely kinetic. And if you're in a war zone, then don't use the parachute. You know, just knock the thing down and, uh, and don't worry about where it goes and where it falls and whatnot. So. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for coming, and I'll stay around down here for a little while and uh, talk to you about blue shirts and whatever else you want to hear about, so thank you. <laughs>